Hey everybody, I'm Jonathan Crow, Director of Content and Community at Ninja RMM. Welcome back to another MSP live chat. I'm really excited to have this session with you guys today. Thank you so much for, for coming in, taking time out of the day. Um, I'm especially excited for our Canadian friends who always seem to be the first ones here in our live chats who come in early or in the chat. I've seen a few people already um, calling in because we got Canadian guests. And above and beyond all that, they're guests that everyone should be excited about seeing because um, these guys are, as Kelvin pointed out, they're kind of big shots. And we're gonna have an exclusive opportunity to hear from them in terms of uh, what they're looking for when they're actively looking for investment opportunities with MSPs. So uh, before we get too far down that path, we introduce these guys. I, of course, wanna kick it over to, to um, our channel chief advisor, Tom Watson. Uh, Tom. Great to see you again. This is a topic that you love as well. Yeah, Jonathan, I'm really excited to be here. We've had some pretty great prep calls leading up to this. I love talking about M&A. A lot of things we're gonna talk about, I did, and I'm learning a lot of things about what you guys need to do, preparing your business for eventually to be acquired, sold, whatever you're gonna do, merge with someone else. There are key things that you need to pay attention to and do that will make it go a lot smoother and make you a lot more money. Yeah, absolutely, and, and one cool thing that came up uh, during our prep calls was even if you don't have, you know, an exit kind of in the near horizon, right? And we launched a poll down there, guys. Actually, if you go down to the bottom of the screen there, you'll see that we, we asked a question around this. What's your rough timeline? Um, we have a couple of people who want to be goat farmers right away. That's cool. Uh, but a lot of folks are saying, you know, this is way far out for me, 17 years. But the thing that, Tom, I know, like, early days when you and I started talking and you were sharing your story about your own exit, um, you brought up the fact that you started calibrating for this way earlier than um, probably a lot of people do. I mean, you were saying what, like six to eight years out or something like that, right? Yeah, well, I made the big changes in my MSP in 2008, 2009. And in 2008 was when I came up with the new mindset and way of thinking that I would eventually sell. sell. And I ended up selling in 2015. So it's pretty much with what you're talking about, Jonathan, with that, that timeline that I was thinking out from is exactly where people need to be. But I think that like six to 10 year mark out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and doing that, you're going to be able to build, like even if you don't sell, you're going to have a business that runs well, right? So, okay, let's, let's uh, kick this over to introduce our guest here. Um, first up, we've got Ravi Ramarek. And, and Ravi, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you are a, a co-founder. Oh, I'm going to take you off mute, Ravi. Uh, there you go, sir. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Ravi, um, you are a co-founder and managing director of MSP Corp based out of Canada. And then we also have David Papp. And David, thank you so much for joining us. You're also, uh, of course, you're, you're, you're uh, Ravi's cohort here. Uh, Ravi was just letting us know that you actually hired him. You're the, you're the reason that he's here, <laughs> That's right. um, for better or for worse. Um, yeah, David started when I was 18. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah, my fault. <laughs> And you're a, you're a CTO at MSP Corp. And I, guys, I want to give a just a, I'll let you guys kind of kick it over and tell um, the audience here what your focus is and give a, a bigger introduction. But I did just want to draw attention over here a couple of things. There's our, our agenda doc, which I'll share a link to you. Um, there's a link to MSP Corp's site, which we'll drop the link into. Um, the, the, just to kind of put some things in perspective here, I'll share some of the good news. I'll, I'll steal your guys' thunder for a second. You were recently highlighted, if, you, if the name is striking, uh, ringing some bells for you guys, they recently raised uh, $35 million for, for MSP acquisitions and investments. So congratulations to you guys for that. Um, but yeah, Rabbi David, I'm going to kick this back over to you and um, tell us a little bit more about kind of what you guys are focused on and what, what your story is. Sure, Dave, I'll go first. Yeah. So we started MSP Corp in 2020. Um, one of the reasons we started for is my partner, Jason Acosta, approached me and had, had mentioned essentially that the MSP industry was a very, very fragmented and still is today, but very fragmented. And what we found was, is, you know, I had been in every single, you know, as Kelvin kind of said, every single chat group, every single kind of MSP related group. And what I had learned through all of that is that there was a lot of operators with great businesses who were looking for exit patterns, but did not want to sell traditional private equity and that if that was for multiple of their own personal reasons and also just based on historical what private equity does to an industry so when jason approached me and said listen i have this idea where we could buy companies 
but make it operator focused, make it employee focused, and really, instead of worrying about profit, worry about culture. And by doing that, we'll drive profit naturally. And so that's kind of how this all got started. So we we got lucky. We met two amazing um, vendors that sold to us in our early days, and we were just uh, we just peanuts, and they, they bet on us, and we you know we ended up raising capital this year, so we sold um, a chunk of our business to uh, BDC and and brought in CIBC for senior. And now we're continuing on the path. So again, our vision is to be the exit channel when you want to retain the company's value system. And that's that's really the big focus for us. But that's in my background, just for everybody to know is, I started my, call it break fix career at David's shop actually, when I was 18 years old, MTech Digital. And um, about five years after that, David sold a part of the business to me which ended up turning into an MSB because at that time, you know, 2000 kind of 10, 11, you know, as Tom knows, things were evolving, MSBs were happening. And I kind of grew that part of the business. And and for me, that's kind of where it all started. So me and David have a long, long history. I, I was, I always like to say people, you know, Dave, I've known David half my life and they kind of laugh and I'm like, no, no, I've really known David half my life. So that's kind of my quick background story for you. Um, I am an operator, like, I, I always say I'm not exactly the most technical person in the room. But what I do understand is how to converse with clients. And I understand enough to be dangerous. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of my quick background. David, you want to go about yours? Sure. Um, so as Ravi indicated, I've been um, uh, I've been involved in the industry for over 30 years. Actually, I've been involved in a ton of different startups. Uh, I got to experience the whole dot-com bubble burst situation. I was uh, CTO of a public company back then. Um, had always had some fun. You know, back in the day, I started when there was, I always laugh, it's before Google, before internet, before whatever, we had bulletin board systems, BBSs, which were really awesome. And I remember being able to connect and pass files and stuff. And I thought, man, this is the future. This stuff is awesome. And so as we grew, uh, an important point that I learned in early 2000, after the whole, uh, you know, the whole bubble burst was the strong focus that need, people need to put on MRR, monthly recurring revenue. That is like key. Too often we see people walking around with that big giant whale harpoon gun on their shoulders looking for the big deal. And that kills a lot of time and energy and those deals don't always happen. So this is actually what was the, the birth of MSPs, right? I mean, back then we called it service as a uh, software as a service. We called it ASP, application service providers. And then this thing of MSPs evolved and that's where we really started focusing on. And, and honestly, the beauty of Ravi and myself within MSP Corp is you're dealing with operators. We know the business. We understand. We're not just financial guys who crunch some numbers and think it makes sense. And it's like, you know, some kind of movie where the Wall Street guys come in and scoop a business up and then tear it apart, fire everybody and keep the keep whatever it is that they wanted for the IP. That's not what we're doing. As Val, uh, what Ravi indicated was we want to maintain the value system that's in place with the current structure, the current staff, the, 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 the clients that you have in place, we want to maintain that. And that is the story. And then you join the family and there's a lot of benefits that we can get into that we can have discussion points, but the benefits are awesome once you become part of the family. And also a big thing is Tom is putting out in the chat here, there's some prep work you need to put in place. If you're thinking about an exit, this is not something that you just do and say, Let, I'll sell to you next month. You might need to put in one, two, three years of prep to get your company ready for that. Well, guys, thank you so much for those intros. And as you can tell, um, audience, these guys are, have been in the industry forever. It's really cool that we have them here. Definitely take advantage of it, right? Um, if you have questions about m and I mean, these guys have also... Uh, built successful businesses. They've been on in, on your shoes, you know, on your side of the table. So definitely feel free to ask questions. Um, you can use the chat or you can use the ask a question function at the bottom there. Um, so I just put the question out there. What does everybody think the biggest factor in valuation is? Like maybe let's get into that, right? Like so, so you guys did a great job of talking about um, kind of what your what makes you guys different in terms of what you're looking at and what you can provide. Uh, uh, the MSPs that you're working with. 
Um, but what are you guys looking for? I mean, what makes a good partner for you? Do you have certain uh, criteria, like right out of the gate, that's disqualifying or, or, or qualifying? I think so. I think that, like, for us, the, the biggest non-starter is, you know, like David said, EBITDA for sure, which is important. I think the biggest non-starter for us is bad culture. So we try to look up the business first. And, you know, we, we look at everything from the reviews to, like, if there's any employee feedback. We always try to go into the group, the chats as well, because a lot of owners fail to realize that a lot of their staff are sitting in the chats, essentially talking crap about them and their company. And, and it's funny, it's a great way to actually go and learn about a business. And we actually even, we were doing a DD on one business last August, and I was in one of the chats on Facebook. And it just, the, the, it just so happens the senior guy was complaining about the owner just focusing on profits for sale and basically just throwing the culture of the business away. So it's interesting. I think that for me personally, and David can give his own opinion too, it's it's culture, it's then of course income, and then recurring revenue. So the three things combined together, I think can make a really good um, MSP. Well, well, why don't we dive in just for, for uh, the, the folks on the line who um, EBITDA also, like, like uh, Corey's pointing out, you know, all, all the business colleges push it. Uh, it gets talked about a lot, but, but can you guys just define that really quickly? Yeah, so even though it's essentially earnings before interest, tax, and depreciation, so in adjustments. So a company generally with a single owner, because I believe most of the callers here will be like a single operator, single owner. Even though it would essentially be the earnings that the operator would take in when they, when they, they normalize their own salary. So let's just put it into context. You have a $2 million MSP, right? And the net income of the MSP is $300,000 a year. So every single year, that MSP, after all its expenses, the owner's paid, everybody's paid, brings in $300,000, okay? That's your net income. So that's this line right here. Where EBITDA comes in is a bit above here. The owner generally will have his own expenses. So he'll have his... Maybe his house, maybe his boat, maybe his car. You know, he bought his 10 kids laptops for university. He's paying for his wife and maybe he's paying alimony. In, in one case I saw, they're paying alimony in the company. These things would all get adjusted back and would turn into EBITDA. So net income here, EBITDA here. So a firm that has 300,000 net income, will generally speaking, not every time, but generally speaking, have about $500,000 in EBITDA. And that's where the real evaluation metric will come into play. So you would you would work with your buyer or strategic seller, whoever you're selling to, or an evaluator, and you would get to that point. Okay. And for you guys, is there kind of a floor that you're looking at? Um, and you, you mentioned, I mean, you, you guys have just been closing some recent deals too. I don't know if you want to bring up any of those as examples. Yeah, well, I, I can for sure. Like, I think when we first started, we were, like most firms, we were a bit more open to probably two to three hundred thousand dollars in EBITDA, like just a bit smaller, so we can get our feet wet. Now we're in the minimum size five hundred, but but average deal, like we just closed one. We just closed a deal for five hundred and we're closing a deal for a million. So I, I would say between five hundred to a million our sweet spot. You know, and then I can give everybody kind of opinion, private equity is gonna be in that one million plus range. That's kind of what they're looking for. Gotcha, gotcha. That's great context. And then um uh, we got some questions coming here. So, Victor, we're going to hit yours up in just a second one. Uh, and, and, guys, keep them coming. This is great. Um, but one quick question that's a follow-up to that. Um, when you're looking at that, you know, 500 um, to a million in EBITDA, um, are there other things that you're looking at there, too? Like, what, like what does a uh, promising, like, high-performing MSP look like at that level? Is there, like, a certain level of um, number of staff they typically have, or are there other factors that kind of pop up? Yeah, that's a good, that's a question. I'll go first, but I think David will also have an opinion, too. Um, I think that, from my point of view, if you're in the $500,000 range, you probably have about 10 to 25 staff, depending on how well you operate. Um, it's super important that your software stack is is up to date like you know buyers don't want to see on-prem servers in your office like david mentioned the chat earlier the buyers don't want to see you outsourcing work to other countries because that's also skewing your revenue i would say that for for the most part you really want to be in that again 10 to, ideal, ideal solutions 15 people 
If you have five hundred thousand dollars in EBITDA, you should have fifteen staff. That's kind of the right number. Ten means you're running everybody dry. Twenty five means you're running things way too like all lazy. And like David just mentioned in the chat, it's not really the five hundred thousand number that matters. It's you want to be in the fifteen to twenty percent EBITDA range. So when you take your net income, which we discussed, right, and you add your ad backs in. So let's say you're three hundred. You add back to 500 when, when everything gets calculated. That 500 really needs to be between 15 to 20% of the business. That's of the margin. That's really where you want to be at. Thanks for that, Ravi. David, you, you've been so active in the chat. This is awesome. Thank you for doing that. Um, <laughs> no worries, man. <laughs> any, any, any kind of thing you want to uh, add on to what Ravi was saying or anything that you want to kind of surface back from what you've been adding in the chat? Um, yeah. So... So what happens for our type of deal, just so that you can understand the flow. So you, you meet a guy like Ravi, he reaches out to you, you strike up a conversation, you're like, and, and Ravi's like, have you ever considered, you know, like, do you have an exit strategy? Have you ever considered selling? So then, then it's always this numbers, right? And we always have to align the numbers and figure out, you know, are we in this, the right ballpark? And there might be some work. And one thing that we need to point out is that we have no problems helping coaching an MSP and staying in contact for like 12 months before we even strike a deal. Like maybe the time isn't right right now, but it might be in the future. And Ravi's done many deals like that already that that have been long in the making. Yeah. So, so what happens is when you get to that point and you're, you're, you're getting things ready, you got to make sure you're not the key man. Like you have to be replaceable like as the the owner in the in the picture and that's why there's a lot of homework i can give to you that tells you how to do that um the other thing is you want to make sure that you're you're going to end up striking up what we call an loi the the letter of intent and that kind of captures the essence of the deal so it says we're, you know, we're going to give you a calculation of this. The EBIT is going to be blah. It's going to be a factor of this. This is going to be the payout with this kind of schedule. It might have an earnout schedule of like, you know, 12 and 24 months, um, blah, 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 blah. And then what happens at that point for our sake is we end up engaging uh, an accounting team who does a financial audit. We call that a QOE. It's the quality of earnings report. And what that does is it basically looks through and it's it's risk identification for us to qualify that the revenue that you stated in the deal is indeed the revenue that we're going to be buying in your company and that there's no major red flags. And a red flag might be like, you know, 70% of your revenue is like one single client. It'd be like, oh shit, <laughs> that's not good, right? <laughs> so anyways, after we do that, the QOE is done. Then you really get the lawyers involved. You have stacks of paperwork. You sign it off, the deal, everybody's done. Money is exchanged hands. And then the, you're, you've joined the family. And then there's huge benefits that Ravi and I could tell you about by joining our family. And why would you do that? You still run your company. There's still a period of time that you're being transitioned, whatever that looks like. In fact, we have owner operators, most of them, who want to stay on even after their final earnout payment has occurred. They still want to stay on board in some capacity. Like that like we really are about a story of not just jumping in, taking over and you know tearing it apart. That's not what we're looking for and Ravi's touched on that. It's all about the culture. We want to retain your clients and your staff as is. Well, thanks for that David. Tom, I know you got something you wanted to jump in on. Yeah, um, I think one thing that's really important that stuck out to me here is I remember back when I had about half a million in MRR. Well, I kind of considered MRR, but it wasn't because I had someone told me, hey, listen, what you're counting as MRR really isn't. Your MRR are your contracts that are auto renewing. And that's pretty much the thing you need to rely upon for the valuation of your business. At that time, I only had, in reality, about 20% of my revenue coming from contracted MRR. So I had to step back, look at how that revenue was coming in, look at the agreements I had, look at the clients that weren't really on solid long-term managed service agreements, and I had to go after those. That was the first thing I did because I was kind of crushed when it was explained to me, no, your business isn't worth nearly as much as you think it is because you're counting all this project work. You're counting all these other things that aren't really under a contract. Maybe they're prepaid hours. Some, they're not under a long-term managed service agreement that's auto-renewing. And I had to completely retool my business and bring as many clients underneath 
true MRR as possible. And that process took me a couple of years, starting in 2008. And that was the pivotal thing, was realizing what your business is really valued upon at the time, what really matters to a potential buyer, and immediately start retooling so that you can, you can increase the valuation. I'm glad you brought that up, Tom, because another part of this whole aspect is we're also not interested in revenue that's associated with legacy services or legacy infrastructure. You've got to be in the 21st century. You've got to be on the cloud, 365, running standard stuff. None of this custom stuff on a rack in your broom closet, and you're calling it a world-class hosting center or data center that you're selling your services on. That's not the right MRR. David, you know, you point that out because I had what I called a data center at our office and uh, it wasn't a data center. And that was one of the moves I made was I was hosting clients data. I'm, I'm right near Ashburn, Virginia. People probably know it as data center alley. And I immediately went over to Lattices and got some rack space and moved all of that stuff into onto new servers and moved the client data there because I realized the level of professionalism across my entire organization need to be raised up. Well, if I'm going to call something a data center, it needs to be in a real data center. And I need to get rid of, as you mentioned, these legacy applications that I'm hosting or that I'm supporting. I need to have a, a modern infrastructure and way of supporting my clients to do so. Yeah, it's funny. We got, we got comments uh, from Alex, too, from, from Lifecycle. Um, and, of course, Alex, he's full-time Lifecycle now, but he was uh, – it's probably about a year, right, Alex, that you, you sold your MSP. So you've got some stories to share, too, I'm sure. You just went through this process. Um, well, yeah, I mean, David, going, going off this point, um, we mentioned it in a prep call, too. So let's see, what are we covered? You covered how you guys look at culture. <laughs> you mind to see, like, what the employees are saying on, on different uh, uh, social channels and review sites and stuff. Um, obviously, you're looking at the financials. But then you also talked about looking at tech stack, which I thought was interesting. I'm sure that everybody's kind of uh, yeah. interested to hear too. So, so you mentioned the things that you're just talking about. You know, you don't want to see legacy stuff, any, anything funky in a broom closet. Um, but anything beyond that, and maybe this goes into you know after you've signed someone up, um, changes that you made. Because I know a big part of uh, that that we talked about was uh, how things are changing, especially around security. Um, anything you want to say there? I can go first, Dave, again. Um, so for me personally, like RMM tool, PSA tools are big, actually. And so for us, like if you're not in like ConnectWise, AutoPass, Ninja, Synchro, kind of like Kaseya perhaps, like kind of stack. I mean, SolarWinds even works out fine, too. If you're not in the, like the, the big six stack of stuff, that's a big flag for us. I mean, you might have your own custom on-prem thing we want to look at, but that definitely hurts. Um Having you using industry standard tools, why a lot of people are say they're against that. I tell them you have to think long term. Like people that are buying your business are buying fifty businesses. They can't have fifty different stacks. So, like for me, that's that's a big one. Arm and PSN. You know, security is huge. Like although I don't expect an MSP to have extremely top of the line MSSP security, I expect you to have at least done something. Like I like seeing ESET, Sentinel One. No big defender. Those are all great products. I like seeing like an um, some sort of zero trust, like either like auto elevate or or threat locker. So for me, those are big on the security side. And then <laughs> in terms of like accounting, we want to make sure you're using regular accounting software. So don't use weird stuff. Use QuickBooks. Use Sage. Use like the standard stuff. That's kind of the big ones for me, David. Your side. Um. Yeah, I'm just commenting on the multipliers and stuff in the chat. Yeah, here. and actually, what David, why don't you bring surface that up to this discussion too? We can circle back around in the stack, but um, because so, yeah, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say you're you're getting some great questions here around. Uh, Victor's hitting you up with you know uh, specific types of contracts, and, and do you prefer to see uh, multi-year contracts, and, and and then also uh, you're getting questions about uh, multiples and things too. So. Um, oh sure uh so quickly on the tool stack one one big thing uh ravi and i have assessed when you're building a big business like this and like let's say we're all moving to the cloud we all have our clients one thing that's underestimated very highly and is a great risk to the business is the cybersecurity aspect like i mean we look at what just happened recently with some of the big ransomware attacks and data breaches that just keep getting worse and worse with time and huger scale uh, honestly, 
it's not just a matter of having cybersecurity insurance in place for yourselves, but what are you doing proactively for that? Not reactively, but proactively in terms of your backups. And, and are you having any kind of uh, separation? Like, could you have archives? Like, are you doing rotations? Are you doing um, like any kind of air gapping? in terms of when it comes to your backups, um, when it comes to being proactive monitoring, like there's tools out there who, you know, have zero trust, you know, when it comes to what executables can run on the computer, on the desktops, on the servers, are you being notified? Like, honestly, that's the tool stack stuff that we're talking about. But not only that, let's face it, every single MSP out there is going to hate this word. I'm going to say it right now. And we run into this problem every single time. Documentation. Like, honestly... <laughs> <laughs> documentation what are you doing like if you're going to join a larger family and you want to see some collaboration and stuff what are your tools that you're using like uh, or is it just on paper napkins and up in your head and you know it and you as the owner understand how that major key client that you have how everything operates there but that's the problem what happens when you're no longer in the picture and somebody has to troubleshoot a problem with that client you know like these are all things that come into play and that's why we love leveraging the cloud everything in the cloud because then you can have your team and if it's standard tools we can jump on that but anyways do you want to jump into some multiples now i'm trying to <laughs> i like i love talking about all this stuff but i mean you know <laughs> we're trying to keep it at a, a brief level here yeah David, i had a follow on that. i had a follow on to that what's one thing i'm hearing is repeatable processes here not legacy stuff and what i think about is Listen, you know, you might have become the go-to MSP for hosting people's 1996 versions of Goldmine on servers. That's not cool. Yeah, you, you're making money off of it, but it's actually a liability to you and your business in terms of liability in running it because it's on-prem and also liability in terms of future valuation. Or you are the go-to for maintaining exchange instances. And so yeah. you have a lot of business that you need to move that stuff over. If you're, if you're using on-prem versions, I know a lot of MSPs I talk to have this thing that they love the fact that they have all this on-prem software still. I can tell you that's going to be a problem because the things have moved away from that. We have evolved to cloud-based. If you're holding on to on-prem, that's going to kick you in the ass later on when you go to have this business. They're going to ask you, why are you maintaining all of these old things? Bring everything up to date. You know, Get the stuff off your own servers. Get it onto services out there where they have the redundancy and fault tolerance, where they can back you up. You don't want to have a bunch of dependencies based on your business that could otherwise not be dependent on your business. You know, and that's a key point I want to touch on. We have several, and this is a hard thing for people to do. They're so tied into their business that they, they have these relationships with their clients and they feel like, you know, personally responsible for the, the setups that they put them in. But clients have to learn that they have to grow as well. And if they're not willing to migrate from, say, an old Zimbra or POP3 or IMAP mail server and going into 365 or something in the cloud, then you just got to let them go as a client. They can go find a solution somewhere else, but they're a risk to your organization to maintain from that point forward. And honestly, if we keep doing this 80-20 rule when it comes to revenue, the amount of time you effort you spend and energy on certain amounts of your portions of your revenue, um, you're going to love it by being able to get rid of some of those clients and shifting into more quality revenue because it gives you more capacity to bring on additional clients and really proactively work with those and grow that business. Like stop being tied down to the legacy stuff and feeling like you owe it to the client. You don't, they have to grow with you and move up and, and, and honestly, there's a million reasons why they should do it. <laughs> well, when, you know what's going to happen when things break and it's some on-prem solution that's 20 years old and you're supporting it. When they break, they're still going to be mad at you. Yeah. And so getting away from that, it's going to it's going to reduce your liability. It's going to make it easier to manage. Don't hold on to old tech. Try to move towards the new. Always thinking, like I tell people, I had a mindset that I want to sell this business someday. I don't know when. I didn't know what year. But I knew that every decision I made needed to make make my business stronger in terms of revenue, in terms of the type of clients, in terms of the contracts I had. Makes sense. Yeah, and, and Alex brings up a good point here. I, I try to bring this up too whenever I hear this because like, uh, this comes up a lot in, in the live chats because it's great advice, right? It's it's that you got to get away. You got to be able to walk away from the customers who are dragging you down, who, who aren't uh, on board with your stack, who are taking up way too much time. 
but it can also be easier said than done, right? Like, and, and, and maybe I want to bring things back just for a second. Um, looking at the, the answers to the poll that we have, um, what's the rough timeline? Uh, we've got a smat, it's like kind of all over the place here, but we've got uh, some people saying, you know, seven to 10 years, five to seven years. So, you know, further out. Um, I'm just kind of interested for, for Ravi and, and David, your guys' perspective. Um, what, if we were going to build these guys a checklist, which maybe we should, but but what are some things that you think that they should be um, um, focusing on to, to kind of gear up to, to the point where um, when that time period does pass, they'll be able to talk to you guys and they're going to get a great evaluation. You guys are going to love them and everyone's going to be very happy. Well, I, I can tell you right now, after this, we'll send everybody a slideshow that we're going to show. It will actually show, but there's essentially, like there's eight things. There's your EBITDA operating profit. There's your recurring revenue contracted like tom said there is also customer and revenue retention which is not often thought, thought about until it's too late if you just go crazy and start signing people on contracts but they churn just as fast in a year that will actually hurt you much more than signing them so just remember that customer revenue retention comes up later in the a acquisition strategy when, you, when you're when you're looking to sell your company growth is always good i think like Double-digit growth is obviously amazing, but single-digit growth that's solid is also good. Um, geography, like if you're in a certain area, try not to lump yourself too much. Like, for example, like if you're in a small town with 200,000 people and you're the only sole MSP operator in that whole town, and that's probably okay. But if you're in New York and all your clients are situated in one tiny area and one tiny niche, like let's say, for example, you're only doing biotech. You're going to make a lot of money doing biotech, okay? You, you are. But when you go to sell, you're going to need a lower eval because you've got no geographic diversification. So that's something to keep in mind. Cus customer concentration is a big one. So, you know, never want one customer to be more than 20 to 25% of your revenue. If you are, you need to bring other customers on right away and try to kind of alleviate that. And then uh, the bigger one is, you know, uh, this is also part of that customer concentration is no five customers should equal 50 percent. that's that's actually bigger than everything else so remember that no five equals 50. if you do that your eval is going to be shot and then you know the little things that matter are like the team how's the seller conversing like you know you have a big business you make a lot of money don't be an asshole i mean that's a simple way to put it i probably can't say that don't be i'd be a nice guy uh, don't be a troll. Like I hate, we, we like out of, of everybody. I hate trolls. Be helpful. Um, and then, yeah, again, like, you know, metric operations, like using bright gauge, which is a popular product to gauge your operations over time and being able to present that to a potential buyer is going to add a lot of value and show them that you're using a KPIs to continually track your performance. So from, from my point of view, that's, that's where I would look at. That's great, Ravi. I mean, thank you so much for that. And and quick quick follow up question there. Um, you talked about uh, uh, you know having the specialty of biotech. I guess what I'm hearing is kind of echoing. Uh, Tom brought this up is is you want to make sure that what you're building is um, boilerplate, basically as boilerplate as possible, and that you're able to hand it off, and then you can walk away, and and you're not you're not the weirdo, right? You're not the the the, the potential I'm buyer's the redheaded stepchild. I'm going to give everybody a two-minute story on what not to do, okay? Okay, all right, perfect. We were doing a deal, me and David, recently, and I, I personally love the guy, okay? Like, i known him for 10 years. I love him, and he's probably watching. I, I love the guy. He's great. But the problem is, every time I tell him, use standard stuff. Don't create your own fact solution. Don't create your own RMM tool. Don't create your own, like, printer ordering policy. Just use Synex. Like, Everything I told him to do, he never did. And at the end of the day, the deal fell apart. And like, I, I just, I struggle so much because there's so many operators who are extremely talented at tech, okay? But what they don't understand is that's not who's buying your business. Like, look, me and David are technically inclined, sure. Like, but even with us, we don't want too many custom solutions. Forget about private equity. They don't want any custom solutions. They want to, they want to see Microsoft, Azure, and, and use it connect wise and, and autocast. Like it gets even the bigger you get, the bigger the buyer gets, the even more scrutiny they have 
on custom solutions. So that's just a good lesson for everybody. I know you think that using cool technology and new tools is going to help your business and your client. Don't do that. Use what works. It's boring, yes, and you're probably going to want to tell yourself because you're so bored, but it does work long term for you. Wow. Oh, man. That is a bit of a trade off. Oh, Tom, you, you wanted to jump in there? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, no, you're there you go. Yeah, Tom, maybe try refreshing coming back on. I think we lost your audio, but if you try to refresh, um, and while you're doing that, uh, another quick follow up question for you, Robbie, and that's. Um, verticals like this is something that comes up all the time too right um is common uh advice is hey pick a vertical specialize in it um be a rock star there it but from what you're saying maybe there's cases where that could actually kind of hurt you are there specific verticals that you like or you stay away from okay so you know what and this will come up like in the chat so there's two different types of buyers you want me to go over that now yeah that'd be great great so let me just uh i'll just share my screen and then we'll just kind of do that for everybody All right, Tom, and actually while you're doing that, uh, Tom, you're back. Let's see if we got your audio. You want to test it out? Maybe not yet. All right, go ahead, Ravi. So hopefully everybody can see this. I, I just made this quick slide, really basic. Okay, there's two different types of buyers, and this will depend on the niche of the client. You have a strategic buyout person, okay? So you have like a guy. I'll give you a good example. You have a healthcare-focused MSP in New York, and they want to expand. So that is a strategic buyer who now wants to buy up other niche-based healthcare MSP providers. So that's the kind of your standard strategic play. So those guys, they're 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 everywhere. So if you go niche, there's a buyer for you. Don't worry about it. There's always a buyer. My only my only recommendation is stay out of hospitality. There's not very many buyers in hospitality, and there never will be. And you know, given COVID, what happened? It's definitely like not going to be an area where buyers are going to be looking anytime soon. So just try to stay to like anything that's um, uh, retail driven, try to stay to that. Focus on B2B or like, or B2G, like B2G government. Those are going to do better for you. So that's a strategic buyer. They're going to come in and they're going to buy you for strategic reasons. Then there's the investor kind of majority acquisition buyer, which is more like us. So, you know, we buy a minimum of 50%. We ideally want to buy 100%, more than 50%. And then we have a strategy of, um, geography based acquisition. So we're buying based on geography and we don't, we don't really care too much. If you're in a niche, you're not in a niche, we're looking more geography wise. So I think there's two different types of buyers and you really need to tailor your business. If you're going to sell it to one of them. When you say geography based, I mean, um, you know, we've got, uh, certainly some clients who they get to a certain size and then they're operating, um, you know, nationally, and it's something now more than ever they're, they're kind of looking into. Is, is that something that, um, I guess, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, national players are always good. So that would probably be more of a investor majority acquisition play. Gotcha. National players are good. So when you're doing it from an investment point of view versus a strategic point of view, you're looking, what you're talking about is called a platform, which is a company that can absorb other small companies. So those are always popular. Those always trade for big values, but I'll give you a warning. Make sure when you go national, you're actually going national. Don't say you're like national in your two cities. That's just not right. Like national means you're in five to 10 plus cities. You're a player. You've got over a hundred staff. Like that's a national firm, right? Yeah, like uh, an, eight, an 80 person firm in three cities is just a state-based firm. They're not, you know, even though they might be in three different states, that's not a national player. So yeah, I, there's definitely tons of value in being a national player. Just make sure you're not stretching yourself too thin and you're not eroding your margins by doing it. That's great. And then um, let's see, Robbie, what else did you want to cover here? There's a couple of other slides, right? Yeah, so there's kind of the, I can go over this with you guys. There's the um, evaluation criteria, which we talked about. So I'll just recap for everybody quickly, and we'll send this to you to send everybody. But you know, awesome. even though recurring revenue, customer retention, uh, growth, valuation, geography, concentration, and then and then other small considerations. You know, a good one for people to learn is a terminology of EBITDA to free cash conversion. So what that means is. 
that's reversing the earlier conversation we have. So your company has $300,000 in net income, okay? We do $200,000 in owner adjustments, and now our EBITDA is $500,000, right? But a lot of companies, when you get later in the stage of closing the deal, they also want to know what's the free cash position. Because if I'm going to pay you 6x on 500000 so all the $3 million, right? How long is my return going to be? On average, you want the EBITDA to cash conversion to be 80%. So if your EBITDA is $500,000, what actually needs to happen every year is about four hundred to four hundred thirty thousand in cash conversion. So it needs to actually make that money in real life. And then, so any any questions or any questions about that? Yeah, we'll see. We'll give people a chance to to add in the the chat sure. and also uh, ask something to Alex there. Um, but yeah, as uh, we wait for that, um, I think we can probably uh, move ahead. There there is one other thing I wanted to get to, but I know you have another slide too. And just a reminder for folks, we got about 15 minutes left, so make sure um, with questions that uh, that you get these in while we, while we still have time. So this is important because this is going to allow you to neatly package your company. So nice. if you're going to go for sale, don't go for sale till all this is done. Get three years of revenue financial reports ready. And make sure your accountant and yourself are calculating your EBITDA and your operating statements. Any standard accountant across everywhere would be able to do that. Make sure you have a list of your employees and expense breakdowns. And, you know, Victor's touching on this right now. And we'll talk about it in a second, but like yeah. you making sure also that your employees are ready for the sale. You know, we don't talk about this too much, but if it, but, but it, it can be jarring for a lot of employees to find out you sold your business. If you don't, encourage them to talk about it because you want it to be a good thing for them. You want to be like, Hey, I'm joining this great company. You're all going to have more opportunity. You're, you're, you know, you're going to make more money. We're going to have access to more tools. We're going to have access to better leads. Like, so that's really important. Um, and, and I think that that's super big, um, percentage of revenue breakdown per category. So have your accountant break down your revenue, like services, like Tom talked about actually with his own company. Don't just assume because you have $500,000 a month, that that's going to get you an eval. What we really want to see is how much of that is contracted revenue? How much of that is hardware? How much of that is project? How much of that is maybe backup or cloud? So try to have a general breakdown. It can be basic, um, basic asset liability list. So list all your products out. Like, do you have real estate? Do you own cars? Do you, you know, have that all listed out with valuations? Customer concentration, this is a big one. You're going to get asked to put usually an Excel spreadsheet or some form of your top 20 customers and their revenue per year. And that's a big one. And then a list of your software. So basic vendors list. And then, you know, location, client vertical. So these are the big things that you want to have ready, neat in a package. Some of this can be in a Word document. Most of this will be prepared by your accountant. So when you go to market, it's really neat. Nice. Yeah, this is such a great list, and Robbie, thank you, thank you guys, and David too for saying that you're gonna no, you're gonna no share this with us. And... Questions on the side? Um, yeah, well, actually, on the slide, yeah, folks, if if you do have questions, definitely let us know. Um, it seems like uh, uh, this is kind of where I was thinking too, as, as Victor pointed out. There's some more questions about um, preparing the team, right, and, and working with your employees, and, and obviously, you know, Victor and others here. They're good, thoughtful owners. Um, you know, your employees, these are people that you become extremely close with. You want to do right by them. And this whole process, I'm, I'm sure this could bring up a lot of anxiety. And I'm sure you guys have seen it handled both well and not so well. Um, we, we've dealt with what trust me, I can tell you this. I've spent hundreds of hours dealing with not well, mass exodus, and then I spent no hours. So let me give you my personal opinion, right? Talk to your staff. I'll tell you why. Even though you don't need to involve them, right? They are your business. You are just a part of your business. And this is my opinion to everybody on this, on this thing. Pull your staff aside, have a team meeting and tell them what you're doing. Say, you know, I would like to sell the company. I'd like to grow bigger, but I'm not the right person. We need more help. And, and, and that engaged conversation done in a good way 
will inspire a lot of confidence because your staff, for the most part, love your company. Like, it's so funny. We don't think about this, but like in IT, you know, the level one help desk guy, you must love your company because he's in it getting yelled at all day long. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so, you know, he must love your company because he's still there because there's lots of jobs available. You can go become and make, you know, basic income and they've chosen to stay with you. So I, I think that it's important to be able to understand that like, while you don't need to share with everybody, it's not probably going to cause much harm. And you might save yourself some headache because if a couple staff want to leave, that's good. You can deal with that before you go to market. So like you can actually deal with that now. We just had a really interesting situation where the, the owner, which is fine. We don't encourage the owner to tell the staff. We allow them whatever economy they want. The owner didn't tell the staff because of their earnout. The staff found out just through the way, whatever channels they found out. And it created a mass exodus problem because it sounded like private equity was going to buy their company and rip it apart. I was able to jump in. Now, hopefully some of them are listening, but I was able to jump in and talk to them about our experience, our value system. And, you know, we retained every single person. Nice. And, and so, wow. you know, the, re the reality is, is that it's up to you. But I always say, you know, uh, uh, treat your staff with respect as your partner. And those staff will be loyal to you till the end. Now, I've got a story for you guys. When I went, when I prepared to sell, what I did was I went ahead and found a broker. And then the business was put on biz buy sell. It was all very quiet. I did not talk to any of the employees about it. I waited until I had a potential buyer who seemed very serious, who it looked like it was going to go forward. And we were maybe a couple months out from the actual sell. At that point, I told the employees and then a couple of days later, we brought the potential buyer in to meet with them. But what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to create any kind of expectations of, hey, we're looking. And so they felt like there was, you know, it was up in the air. I didn't I didn't want them to know anything until it was pretty much solid of what was going to happen. But I did it as soon as I knew, hey, this is the company that's going to buy us. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. You know, uh, when are these discussions happening, ideally? Um, <laughs> Tom nailed it. That's actually the, if what Tom did is actually the best way to do it, if you can do that, is just kind of a path of as things progress and get more serious, bring more people into the fold and do it slowly. That Tom's model is, if you, if you can do that, Tom's model is the best model. So, Ravi, this came up during our, our prep call. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I may have uh, miss, miss, uh, uh, took, took this the wrong way, but. Um, have you worked with owners who who kind of go beyond just that step and, and kind of work things out to where, um, you know, an exit is, is financially good for, for their employees as well? Totally. I would say actually most owners have the employees with some sort of options. Um, you know, I usually see some either bonus structure. So the owner will sell and give every staff a bonus, which I highly recommend, by the way. Um, that, that's a good one. Um, there is some employees that have like uh, preferred shares or stock options. Um, but I would say probably the bonus is more common. I think that when you sell your business, remember this, you are only one person. 14 or 15 or 10 or 100 other people made you money. Don't forget them. Because just as easy as they made you money, they could leave, right? And, and the business then falls apart. So I think that it's really important that owners take a step back when they sell and they say, you know what? I put in 20 years. I put in my blood and sweat. I always tell owners, take 5% and divvy it to the staff because it, one, one, that costs you nothing. Okay. Two, the staff are all like super impressed and, and three in the grand scheme. So most deals, as you guys are going to be aware of, yes or no, you might not, they have an earn up period. So the deals are generally structured in 100% buyout, but you'll have like 50%, 60% up front, 20% over year one, 20% over year two. That's kind of a standard deal structure. By giving those employees that little bit of bonus, you're protecting your downside on clawback and, and negative, negative consequences over the next two years because the employees are bought in with you. Right before we get you off the hook here, um, there's a, a question from Darren um, asking about um, is the company worth more if we're part of a franchise? And, and David said, 
Uh, I don't really like it, but let's let Ravi talk about it. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Two trains of thought. Like, franchise could be the 20 model, which is more of like an independent franchise. Right. Or are you part of a Quickie Mart, like, kind of like Nerds on Site franchise? Nerds on Site franchise, not a good thing to be. Like, get out of that. Not that Nerds on Site, nothing. Not there's anything wrong with those franchises. They're perfectly fine. You make a lot of money. But for you to exit, they're not going to work. But but if you're in like a group where like you're using this franchise model, like even like, um, uh, you know, Charvest, those other guys where they're kind of like, they're giving you all these kind of uh, documentation and models to run on. Those are fine. I feel like it won't affect it as long as you're not using uh, their brand for the area. Because in 99% of franchise agreements, you can't sell to a private operator or buyer without first getting franchise approval, which means they'll probably take it back from you. So that's, that's I think, David's comment on negativity is that there's not very many franchises that it would allow you to sell using their name. So, so Ravi touches on an interesting point that everybody should be aware of is you're going to start collecting all of your documentation and contracts that you have with other companies, including your landlord, you know, for your office space. Because there is a clause in a lot of contracts and agreements that's called the change of ownership notification clause that could kill you. You could go right through to the deal, have the LOI, be doing the due diligence, and you're ready to finalize and handshake and get the deal done. And your landlord could kill the deal because they don't approve of the change of ownership. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That is a very interesting situation, actually, yeah. That's insane. Well, guys, uh, we got a few minutes left here. I want to make sure that we have a, do kind of like a last call for, for questions from the audience. Um, and as those are coming in, uh, I also want to uh, tell everybody to stick around because we're going to um, uh, highlight some upcoming events. We're going to show you how to get in touch with these guys. Um, of course, there's, a, there's the website. Um, and we're going to be sending out that email right after this event or probably tomorrow that includes that great checklist that, uh, that Ravi uh, provided. So, uh, but, but Tom, I'm gonna to toss it over to you here for some kind of final thoughts from you, because again, you went through this process. Um, you took a very thoughtful, um, planned out approach to it, but your favorite question, right? If you're gonna do it again today, what, what are you taking away from this conversation and, uh, and just your experience in general? What, what are some things that you're gonna be doing differently and prioritizing? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, David and Ravi have brought me all kinds of new things to keep in mind, but I'm going to back up to one thing I think was really important when I think about this. When I learned that, hey, that half a million dollars of revenue, that was not what I needed to sell this business later on, and that I needed to retool to, to real MRR, there's another thing I realized, that in the processes of the business, I was still a technician, I was still messing around with the books, I was doing all, I was project management. I was doing so many things. And I realized the next thing to do, I needed to start pulling my back, my, myself back from whatever I didn't need to be a part of and focus only on revenue generation and closing deals. And that I also, because when I sold, I knew that I was not the type of person who could stick around. I couldn't do it. And I think there's a lot of people like that. And when they sell, they're not going to sit there and be reporting to someone else, be working under someone else. I knew I needed to exit. And when I did, a lot of the employees stayed, pretty much everyone for a while. But I exited and I was gone in two weeks after the sale closed. And one wow. of the reasons that worked out was because I was only closing business deals at that point. I was not doing – I had immediately saw – when I, when I needed to increase the valuation of my business and I wanted to sell it, like six years before it happened, I started figuring out ways I could back off a of technical work. By the time I sold the business, I hadn't done any technical work in five years, and those things were not tied to me. Anything I could make a repeatable process that was documented that others could do, I had done. So I kind of followed a franchise model for how I ran my business in terms of that all that documentation and processes where I wasn't as important to the business. And I think that was pivotal in my ability to unload the business on my terms and relatively quickly. Yeah, Tom, you're getting, uh, you're getting lots of amens from the chat uh, too. Of, of This is how I think a lot of folks would like to be and it's a, it's a tough thing to, to kind of pivot to. Um, you know, we did have one question from uh, Shui that David, you're, you're kind of addressing in the chat. Thank you again for that. Um, but it's a great one. And you know, you, you guys have talked about um, uh, culture and, and all these other qualities of the company. 
when it comes down to the specific owner, and okay, maybe you have scenarios just like Tom was describing, where you know he set things in such a way where two weeks later he's out. But uh, you were mentioning a lot of people are staying on, owner operators, they, they stay on. Is there anything, I guess, how important is that, uh, that you guys have a great you know, connection with the owner? Um, and are there any qualities that you're looking for there? I, I can tell you from my point of view, because I talked to them lots. I would think just, you know, somebody who's very personable. Like, look, we all have a business. We're all stressed out. Uh, like, like Denny says, what is vacation? We get that. Like, I've been there. Like, we get it. I think just being personable is the most important thing of all other things. Like, you can train tech. You can train financial prowess. But you can't fix somebody who's a jerk. Like, you can't. Right. But you can fix the rest. So we can coach you. Like if you have a great business within the next level or you want help, I'll tell everybody on this call, you know, our emails are always open. Like even if you're even if you're five years out, feel free to ask, because for me, I wish somebody had offered me help when I was asking, how do I do this? Like, where do I build? And what I found was people are like, oh, it's a guarded secret. Well, it's not. It's a pretty simple model. But sometimes you need a bit of a nudge in the right direction. So just for everybody on the call, you know, that's a big thing for me is don't feel shy on asking your peers and your others for feedback on what you're doing. A lot of the group chats can be pretty toxic sometimes. So feel free to email people individually and ask them. Most people in, in the MSP industry are quite nice. And it's just the trolly people online that usually have a crappy business anyways. They're the only ones offering negative advice. So that's kind of my, my opinion on, on that. Yeah, yeah. You know, guys, I've, I've talked about this once before. Um, when I made the decision that I was later going to sell was like 2008. And that summer, I went on a trip to Italy. And I've told people about this before. I chose not to turn on my BlackBerry overseas. And I left yeah. everything to my employees who were back in, you know, at running my MSP. And you know what? It really strengthened my business. It worked out. It was one of those steps I took towards separating myself and my importance to day-to-day -day operations. And I think these little moves you make in terms of not doing tech work, taking real vacations, not being tethered to your phone, these things will make your business stronger because you need your employees to take that weight that you've been carrying that really make the valuation a lot stronger. People are going to be looking at that. That's what I'm hearing from, from Ravi and David. They're going to be looking at the rest of the team and not just you. I always love that story, Tom. It's such a good one. Um, well, guys, we are coming up right here at the top of the hour. Um, this has been amazing. We got a few comments here in the chat. This has been enlightening. Um, I'm so thankful for you guys spending the time. Um, I want to bring up your website, of course, um, MSP corp.ca um, and also here in our document um, we've got links to, to you guys as well uh, I'm gonna reiterate that we're gonna follow up with an email um, Ravi I mean it, because you've offered kindly uh, for your email maybe we can add that right here in the doc if that's okay with you yeah no problem I mean I, I'm just I'm always welcome to help people like there is no David's joking there's never gonna be a charge for anything we do but the reality is, you know, my time is limited to keep that in mind, but oh, yeah. I'm happy to give you like a high level discussion, go over what you've been doing so far and then tell you what you need to do. Now, you might not agree with me, but I'll give you the buyer's perspective. That's amazing. Yeah, David charges, Ravi doesn't. We got that. That's good. <laughs> um, and then I just want to give a quick shout out for, um, let's scrolling down the dock here. Where do we go? Here it is. Okay, so our next event, this is going to be Thursday, October 28th. We're going to be uh, getting into the Halloween spirit, and we're going to be sharing oh, IT yeah. horror yeah. stories. Um, clearly, we all have IT horror stories to share. Um, Ravi, I mean, David, you guys, maybe you can submit a couple that we can we can pull up. Um, I'm sure you got a couple. Tom certainly does. And well, John, uh, Jonathan, I'm going to be in costume for that one. i got to so tell I mean, everyone. Yeah, You're going to be in costume. If anyone needs any more reason to show up to this, then there you go. You've got it. You're it's going to be, it's gonna be really good. It's going to be epic. <laughs> Um, and of course, we want to hear from you. So keep an eye out for your emails. We're going to be following up with some prompts. We want to hear your stories. We're going to be giving away prizes too. It's going to be a good time. So I wanted to give a shout out for that. Um, but with all that said, uh, Ravi and David, thank you so much um, for being so generous with your time. Um, no it's clear you guys are just huge contributors to the community. Um, really awesome to hear your stories and, and have you guys share your experiences. So thank you again. 
No problem. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Great work. And thank you, everybody, in the chat. We'll see you soon. All right. Take care, everybody.